For the longest time, I believe that Darwinian evolution explains what we saw in biology. Not because I saw how it could actually explain it, but because I was told that it did explain it. And in schools, I was taught Darwinian biology. And through college and graduate school, I was in an atmosphere which just assumed that Darwinian evolution explained biology. And again, I didn't have any reason to doubt it. It wasn't until about no, ten years or more ago that I read a book called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by a, a geneticist by the na name of Michael Denton, an Australian, and he put forward a lot of scientific arguments against Darwinian theory that I had never heard before, and, and the arguments uh, seemed pretty convincing. And at that point I, I started to get a bit angry because I, I thought I was being led down the primrose path. Here were a number of very good arguments and I had gone through a, a doctoral program in biochemistry, became a faculty member, and uh, I had never even heard of these things. And so from that point on I became very interested in, in the question of evolution and, and uh, since have decided the Darwinian uh, processes are not uh, the whole explanation for life. Michael Behe's skepticism derived in large measure from what modern biology has revealed about life's most fundamental unit, the cell. In the 19th century when Darwin was alive, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. This perception didn't really change too much until the early 1950s. But in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. Today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. Worlds so small that a thimbleful of cultured liquid can contain more than four billion single-cell bacteria, each packed with circuits, assembly instructions, and miniature machines, the complexity of which Charles Darwin could never have imagined. At the very basis of life, where molecules and cells run the show, we've discovered machines, literally molecular machines. There are little molecular trucks that carry supplies from one end of the cell to the other. There are machines which capture the energy from sunlight and turn it into usable energy. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in my view. One machine particularly attracted his attention. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts in all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, 
proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. The idea of irreducible complexity can be illustrated by a familiar non-biological machine, a mousetrap. The trap is composed of five basic pieces a catch to hold the bait, a strong spring, a thin bent rod called the hammer, a holding bar to secure the hammer in place, and a platform upon which the entire system is mounted. If any one of these parts is missing or defective, the mechanism will not work. All components of this irreducibly complex system must be present simultaneously for the machine to perform its function catching mice. Irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellar motor. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. In evolutionary terms, you have to be able to explain how you can build this system gradually when there's no function until you have all those parts in place. But could Darwin's small, favorable variations have produced a bacterial flagellum? Some scientists doubt the possibility. How could something new, like a bacteria flagellar motor and all the components that go with it, how could it develop out of a population of bacteria that don't have that system? When each change, according to Darwin's theory, has to provide some kind of advantage. Imagine such a scenario early in the Earth's history. An evolving bacterium somehow develops a tail and perhaps even the pieces necessary to attach it to the cell wall. Yet without a complete motor assembly, this innovation would provide no advantage to the cell. Instead, the tail would lie immobile and useless, invisible to natural selection, which by definition can only favor changes that aid survival. The logic of natural selection is very demanding. Unless the flagellum mechanism is completely assembled and actually works, natural selection simply cannot preserve it. It cannot be passed on to the next generation. The important thing to realize about natural selection is it selects only for a functional advantage. In most cases, natural selection actually eliminates things, things that have no function or that have a function that harms the organism. So if you had a bacterium with a tail that didn't function as a flagellum, chances are natural selection would eliminate it. The only way you can select for a flagellum is if you have a flagellum that works, and that means you have to have all the pieces of the motor in place to begin with. So natural selection can't get you the bacterial flagellum. It can only work after the flagellum is there and operating. In 1996, Michael Behe published a book titled Darwin's Black Box. In it, he argued that natural selection, Darwin's designer substitute, could not explain the origin of the bacterial flagellum or any other irreducibly complex biological system. Instead, Behe concluded that the integrated complexity of these systems pointed to intelligent design. Darwin's black box created immediate controversy. 
Over 75 publications, including some of the world's leading newspapers and scientific journals, reviewed the book. Some scientists praised Behe's work, while others dismissed it as unscientific and religiously motivated. Behe's critics also insisted that he had underestimated the power of natural selection. They argued that the flagellar motor could have been constructed from parts used to build simpler molecular machines, like this needle-nose cellular pump. If the components of the pump already existed, they could have been preserved by natural selection even before the bacterial motor arose. This theory is called co-option. It's essentially saying that evolution or natural selection at some point was able to borrow components of one molecular machine and build a new machine with some of these components. Scott Minnick has studied the flagellar motor for nearly 20 years. His research has led him to challenge the co-option argument. With a bacterial flagellum, you're talking about a machine that's got 40 structural parts. Yes, we find 10 of them are involved in another molecular machine, but the other 30 are unique. So where are you going to borrow them from? Eventually, you're going to have to account for the function of every single part as originally having some other purpose. So you can only follow that argument so far until you run into the problem of you're borrowing parts from nothing. But even if you concede that you have all the parts necessary to build one of these machines, that's only part of the problem. Maybe even more complex, I think more complex, is the assembly instructions. That is never addressed by opponents of the irreducible complexity argument. Studies of the bacterial motor have indeed revealed an even deeper level of complexity. For its construction, not only requires specific parts, but also a precise sequence of assembly. You've got to make things at the right time. You've got to make the right number of components. You've got to assemble them in a sequential manner. You've got to be able to tell if you've assembled it properly so that you don't waste energy building a structure that's not going to be functional. Building a molecular machine has been compared to the construction... So it is with the construction of a flagellar motor. You build this structure from the inside out. You are counting the number of, of components in a ring structure or the stator. And once that's assembled, there's feedback that says, okay, no more of that component now. A rod is added. A ring is added. Another rod is added. U-joints added. Once U-joints at a certain size and a certain degree of, of bend, about a quarter turn, that's shut off and then you start adding components for the propeller. These are all made in a precise sequence, just like you would build a building. To build a motor correctly requires a complex system of machines that coordinate the timing of the assembly instructions. But how could natural selection construct such a system? The co-option argument doesn't explain this. You see, in order to construct that flagellar mechanism or tens of thousands of other such mechanisms in the cell, you require other machines to regulate the assembly of these structures. And those machines themselves require machines for their assembly. If even one of these pieces is missing or put in the wrong place, your motor isn't going to work. So this apparatus to assemble the flagellar motor is itself irreducibly complex. In fact, what we have here is irreducible complexity all the way down. We know a lot about the bacterial flagellum. We still have a lot to learn, but we know a lot about it. And uh, there's no explanation for how this complex molecular machine was ever produced by a Darwinian mechanism. 150 years ago, scientists did not know about irreducibly complex molecular machines. Yet Charles Darwin anticipated the difficulty that systems such as these could pose to his theory. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down.